Hey everybody, Payments Professor back again with part two of what I learned at Payments Innovation Alliance. And that's the International Payments Innovation Alliance meeting that takes, took place this summer in Berlin. I was there with my friend Joe Casale from Wrestling Payments. You guys wanna go check out Wrestling Payments. He and I collaborated to get a couple of podcasts recorded. This is my version of the podcast that got recorded. Joe, I think, has already put his up. He's, he's faster getting his up than I am. I gotta give him a lot of credit for that. And I gotta say too, if you're not a member of Payments Innovation Alliance, I've got a podcast about what Payments Innovation Alliance is. Here's two podcasts now, this is part two, that discuss what's happening as far as the world of uh, Payments Innovation Alliance and the, the global international meeting. You should really go check it out. But before I say anything else, how about we just check out this part two of the Payments Podium PIA International Version Special Edition. Welcome back to Wrestling Payments. Literally, we are we just con continuing to part two of the International Payments Alliance meeting by Nacha because I don't think I I didn't get through like one page of my notes so far. So let's keep going. When we last left, we were talking about the LEI and verification of ID and or, or receiver, if you will. Uh, you want any more to say on that? I think we got enough on that. I mean, I, I think. I know I will. I'm sure you will, too. I know Nietzsche will probably be putting out some stuff to be able to help explain what that is, what to look at as far as what's coming. Um, can I give you the one of the biggest quotes that I got out of Payments Innovation Alliance that like made me go, what? Yeah, that, that and it was this Germany is getting rid of checks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, in the back of my mind while we're doing all this, it's how many banks are compared to how many banks in the U.S.? Is it is it a couple of things, right? Is it easier with less institutions? Because people, you know, uh, checks have been around for a really, you know, hundreds of years. People are pretty attached to them. Uh, the other part is it is it easier with less institutions? But is it easier when you can say no more checks? It's a mandate. Uh, we don't we don't do mandates a lot here in the U.S. We do laws. And we pass, you know, things like, uh, 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 what am I, I'm, I got stuck. What was the most recent? Regulations, rules and all that. Yeah. I actually say we do recommendulations. We make <laughs> recommendations that get treated like the regulations, but they're really not. Yeah. The thing I, I lost was the Dodd-Frank part. Dodd-Frank, you know, they, you know, they stuff a bunch of changes through um, at once as a, a reaction to things, um, as opposed to, you know, I, I think it's a little different over there where, you know, do we want pieces of paper flowing through the system? I, you know, uh, I, you know, as an ACH guy, I say no, but how do you, how do you say no, you, uh, t corporate treasurer can no longer write those little pieces of paper? Well, okay. The part two of that, that blew my mind was they said, all but one, all but one of the use cases that they have found of how checks are still used can be resolved with an instant payment or a recurring payment. So, and basically, you know, a FedNow, RTP, or an ACH, right? All but one. Do you remember what that one was? Because that one, you know, it blew my mind. The one use case is for the it situation. Was so silly, yeah. It was silly. It's this. It's the one use case of what they can't solve for is when somebody sends a check hoping it won't be deposited. Yes. Hard to solve for that one. Hard right, to solve. Right. And I was like, wait a minute, that's a real use case. And they were serious that, you know, there are, I guess, rebate type check situations, which I, I've actually seen before to where these are checks that go out and people do hope that, hey, they never get cash. They get the money back, which is a weird, unique use case that I never realized until that meeting and them talking about getting rid of checks that it does also exist here in the U.S. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It does. Oh, absolutely. Yep. I remember, so I got a bunch of notes. Uh, this is the part of the meeting for me where, uh, where it was really, you know, an alphabet soup of SEPA, 
ISO, uh, Target 2, PSD3. So, you know, it, it seemed like a lot of, uh, they're so used to speaking about these solutions that, you know, they, they're throwing out, you know, like we do in our meetings, uh, code words. Um, and faster payments is certainly further along in these countries. I mean, they, they've probably been around for a decade or more. So it's, it's not, I, I get the feeling in the U.S., they're still seeking the use cases for how do we uh, switch to instant payments for payments we're making. And over there, it's, it's everyday, everyday instant payments. Mil, was it millions or billions of transactions a month? For their instant payments, it's still in the millions, but they're up, they're reaching it higher. So they're they're in millions and millions though. Whereas uh, you know we look at like RTP, which I would say is successful because it's millions per month now too. But they're more like millions per day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now you know it's funny that you do mention that the different acronyms that were actually used too. And remind me, I think it, I think I'm going to say this right, but remind me if it's not true. Their service providers are more uh, regulated, if you will. They they have responsibilities, and you know, uh, it's it it's. I think it's you know, probably using the wrong word here. A little loose here, of who you know who oversees or examines the service providers, and over there they are you know. Uh, they certainly um, get into the, you know, get the keys to the kingdom, but then they have responsibilities. Well, here we have, and there's, and there, I mean, there's some great organizations out there even really that pay attention to this, but we have, you know, third party service provider management requirements. We've got all kinds of rules that have been passed on managing your third party service provider. We look at like, say, operating circular eight. It does have a section specific for service providers, but overall it says the financial institution is going to be responsible for their service provider. And the section really says, hey, as a service provider, if you do anything that affects the financial institution, you have to let them know. There, it is more like the service provider signs up directly to work with the central bank, to be vetted by and approved by the different associations, organizations, and like I said, central banks that allow them to get their licensing to be able to proceed and move forward. And they have to do things and meet standards at a, I don't know if I want to say higher, but at least a different level than what mm -hmm. service providers in, in the U.S. have to do. Now, and I got to be careful. I am a service provider, but <laughs> and I know that a lot of it is different. And I do know there are some things that as a service provider, like with the Fed now service that we have to be able to meet with the RTP service that we do have to be able to meet. But it's just handled differently there because of the way it's looked at, I guess. That's that's an interesting point is. But it, as we're talking when you know and feel free we can cut this out if it if it's not a good question um that's because you're you're signing an agreement as a vendor if you will of of uh, a tie-in to a solution over there it's more the licensing part right the uh regulator so i don't i don't i mean i don't is fed now um a regulator of their stuff as well as a provider of their stuff? See, I don't think so. I think it's a little different. This is opinion, of course. You know, all my FedNow friends, if you're out there, because I look at, like, say, FedNow audit requirements. Okay, my personal opinion, they're kind of a joke. And the reason being is you're just meeting the assurance program, the Fed's assurance program, which doesn't go into detail, doesn't say, look at this, 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 you know, type of stuff. It just says, make sure you're meeting our security requirements according to operating circular one, five, eight, whatever, right? And I believe, in my opinion, there should be more. And I know that over there, that is what they do have, is they have the higher requirements of you have to meet these and check off these different boxes versus here we just sign forms saying, hey, we know we're responsible. Yes, we're doing these things. But right, I mean, right. 
Now that's the form in all transparency, going a little bit down the rabbit hole here, FedNow and RTP do have high requirements for what service providers are required to do to meet their connections. Yeah, I mean, as far as how long they have to be on, the levels of security that have to be on there, and the different checks. So I don't want anybody thinking out there, oh man, the US is really lackadaisical on this. They're not, we just approach it in a different way. Right, but the, but the difference still is you're, you have, in one case, it's a relationship between a provider of a service and a vendor in that service, as opposed to um, a regulator of a, an entity. Yes. Okay. As I'm moving through my book, my next page, dun, 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 was on the digital euro. So if you aren't aware, and I don't, I, I, forgive me, I don't know where these rules came from. But uh, the, the Payments Alliance follows, follows Chatham House rules, which means you can say what happened at the meeting, but you can't attribute it to anyone. Especially getting the digital euro, I'm not going to say names, her opinions on that one. I'm leaving that one alone. <laughs> but if you've ever had a, a, a meeting, a session, a, a town hall on something that touched a, a central bank digital currency and it tends to get a little bit heated. There was heat, there was heat. Um, there was controversy, there was, um, uh, th there was uh, energetic discussion <laughs> around the digital euro. And I think it goes back to the same, the same issues, right? The privacy issue, um, I think a little fear of uh, te uh, technology for me as far as, uh, if it's literally not a piece of paper anymore. And, and you know, there was a lot of great discussion about, uh, you know, those folks have been around in, in banking for a while. You know, an ACH, right, is that digital money, right? Because paper never flows. It's really just balances. There are those folks that would argue that digital money is already around because, money's moving and transferring from institution to institution, from an account to account, never existing as a piece of paper. So there's that argument, which I appreciate. That's, you know, I could argue, I could jump in that bandwagon, but this was the whole idea of, it. it, it they didn't introduce it as a CDBC, but at the end of the day, it's a CDBC. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was fun. And well, what was fun too is like, we were just talking about a PSP there, it would be distributed by a PSP there. I mean, mm -hmm. wow. wow, exactly. Right. Imagine that the, you know, your favorite uh, third party service provider actually uh, maintaining those currencies, currencies, real current. I mean, like a, a bank vault, they would have um, a grouping of whatever digital currency they received for whatever they were already doing and get redistributed. It, it's, you know, it's, for me, it's, it becomes that same uh, conversation. Now I did read recently, I don't know where I read it, but it was a headline somewhere that said, as you look globally, uh, lots of central banks are really hot on this central bank digital currency idea. Um, but when you sit in a room and talk about it, there's a lot of, but, 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 so thoughts. Oh, this is going to be a hot topic for decades to come. And I said decades because though it is moving forward in some countries, others, it's not moving as fast as people think. The Asian markets are definitely adopting this philosophy a lot more. The government controlled banks like, you know, say China, absolutely going that route. But the more free markets, let's say, no. I mean, I think in the U.S. we are far from seeing it. My opinion, too, I don't think we need it. That now solves for what a, a digital currency would do anyway, without having to have the same level of information that maybe we don't need to look at, in my opinion. Now, the way they're talking about it there, though, is it is moving forward faster than, of course, what we're seeing here in the U.S. And they're looking at at the end of this year to be able to start releasing more on this is what to expect. People I've talked to, no names are going to be saying here, said it's going to happen. It's just a matter of the when and how. 
And it's also the win is within the next couple of years uh, is what I'm hearing from my sources over over there. So that's mind blowing to hear, too. But there are a lot of issues that as they're doing the doing this the right way, too. I mean, I got to say that they're doing this the right way. Multiple groups, multiple organizations are involved. Everybody does have a say. So lots of research is being done. Lots of discussions like the one we had are happening, too, that they are uncovering, hey, this would be an issue. This is how we resolve it type situations. But I, I wrote actually in my notes that, you know, look at November 23 to uh, 25 is where we're at right now. It's which is they're going to be going into that phase two, the preparation state and uh, prepping for it to actually be in place. So come the end of this year, we should be able to see more on, hey, what's happening and how's it going to move forward? But we also heard sources who can't be disclosed that it, it may it may slow down some while they have identified some of these issues and, and find the right solutions to solve for them. Yeah, I mean, it's again, I, I don't think it was much different than a digital a CBDC uh, meeting here. The thing, the note that I did, you know, I, at this point, I realized my mistake. I was writing my notes and that means I need to rewrite my notes. But so one of the things that caught my eye is uh, stable coins are regulated. Are read this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stable coins are already regulated in EU, which I, I, I think there's a lot of proposals in the US, but I don't think we've reached the stable coin is regulated in the US. We've had a lot of things come out from different organizations. It's a couple of different letters. I know FDIC's put out some stuff. There, though, they have MICA. MICA is actually the Marketing and Crypto Association. I thought that was, whoa. And they have come out and said, hey, here are some things to know about dealing with stable coins, cryptocurrency type situations to where there are higher levels of requirements in place. We, uh, we should figure out how to share notes because literally we have the same notes. I have MICA right here. I was like, well, and I was going to ask I was you. beside you copying your notes. <laughs> <laughs> the other note I have here is Bundesbank, which you had to learn how to say different institution names, has four versions of the digital euro. Do you recall that note? I recall what it was. Is I understood it to be more like a use case. So I was wondering in that, I got a little confused because I was wondering in that discussion, are we talking about four different versions? Are we talking about use cases? Was that one that things got lost in translation? A quick note on the Payments Innovation Alliance International meeting. It's all in English, but mm -hmm. not everybody there is a native English speaker. So that should be noted, but it's 100% in English, 100%. You don't need an interpreter, anything like that, to be able to talk to these people from the different countries. However, I and mean, it happens in the U.S. too. We start saying things like, is that a soda, a Coke, or a pop? And so there was some of that that would happen. And if you weren't a native English speaker, you know, I, I felt like maybe it's getting lost in translation. So I could be wrong, but I felt like they were looking at and discussing more how this would be used versus the different versions. But I think what it was is there were different versions for the different use cases. Yeah. And, and uh, again, this is, uh, you know, being in the Payments Alliance for a long time, these are not conferences. These are not, you go, you listen to a session and, and you go to the next room. These are intended to be conversations and, and interactive. And this was, you know, if, and this is why we maybe, because uh, I remember seeing some slides in the presented slides. You didn't get to the slides because the conversation, you know, immediately talked about privacy. Let's talk about privacy. And we went off on a on a spiral. It was it was great. Well, and you know, you're right, though. I mean, I can't talk good enough about Payments Innovation Alliance. I've recommended it to people for years. We're coming up on the 10th anniversary this October for the Denver meeting. People sign up. You want to be able to learn this stuff, sign up. If you're afraid that, you know, Joe and I are going to out you on a podcast, again, we will not bring up anybody's names, anything that shouldn't be brought up outside of the meeting. It is, and it's where I go to learn. It's where I've gone for decades now, I can say, to be able to learn because you get the top of professionals in the industry, we can say around the globe, to be able to come and help educate you. 
Mm-hmm. And we are not being paid <laughs> by the Payments no. Innovation Alliance to <laughs> say all these things. Many people, if I pushed over to Payments Innovation <laughs> Alliance, I'd be going free for the rest of my life. But, you know, but, back to the digital euro, one of the things that ended up being its own session, too, that I found fascinating and didn't realize as much was offline payments. Now, when you say <laughs> offline payments, uh, it kind of needs to be defined. And it is basically an instant payment made when the instant payment service isn't available. Wait, what? Yeah, and I was even, okay, how do you do that? And they explained it would be like a card or similar to like what we see with cards. It would be the storing of the information to be able to process it later. It would be for people who maybe don't have a phone and don't have a way of doing their own instant payment. It was, that in itself was like, wow. Like I'm gonna get with, uh, one of the speakers there who's you know an expert on that because i got to learn more it, you know i uh, expectation and and blowing away your expectations i you know i thought an you know when i thought of an offline payment you look at the session title and you go hmm wonder what that's about i imagined cash over a counter definitely uh definitely different uh and really valuable presentation way more you know i expected to have a little mental break at that point it was it was a it was a great I'm session catch up on email i'm yeah. totally transparent is you know you got there's rarely a conference you can go to or a meeting and this is definitely the exception to where every single topic something that i'm going to pay heavy attention to so every now and then i'm just like okay i mean like a lot of us i got to be able to make sure hey this gets taken care of i didn't touch my email didn't get even close to it yeah the whole idea that you're going to get work done um, while you're in a, mm-mm, not happening. Um, well, uh, even in the offline payments, they talk about Norway's cashless, yes. but then brought up, but we had a problem one day. <laughs> to where, you know, the system wasn't available for a little while. What do we do? How does that get resolved? So, th- I mean, that's one of the fears in going to all digital. Now it's all digital. A lot of people talking about going to the digitals, even the CBDCs are not eliminating cash. They are just lowering the need for having the cash, let's say. However, in Norway, they are considered cashless because nobody carries it around. Nobody uses it. Doesn't mean you can't have it available though, but nobody uses it. So it's kind of like, hey, it's non-existent. Um, I'm gonna jump back for a sec- second, but from a um, from an observation perspective. So, uh, I recently listened to a podcast, which was a commitment because it's the podcast name is acquired and they originally started out as talking about acquisitions that are happening in the, you know, different industries, but they've evolved into like full fledged research papers on topics. And they recently did a three hour and 45 minute podcast on Visa. And that turned into really talking about the card industry and how cards work. I observed, and it wasn't necessarily in any session, but the idea that, uh, and not to speak poorly of anyone or any system, but the idea that cards have a, not a monopoly, but a, a, the, they're the easiest way anywhere to make a retail payment or um, make a payment. And the idea that, you know, EU, uh, the companies that are running the card industry aren't necessarily EU, EU um, companies. The, the problem is how do we develop an alternative solution to a completely and in, in, in it's not embedded. It's uh, and and they did they, they dug in as an you know the easiest way to make a payment is with a card. Is there an alternative way to to make payments? And I say that because uh, if we're done with the digital euro, the the again a session that blew my mind was the UPI session. You know. And, and one of the, you know, I highly recommend, again, not paid by these guys, this acquired episode on Visa was fascinating. 
And it was fascinating because, and I'll only pick on one piece, in a transaction, uh, the only one that doesn't actually, I think, either pay or get payment is uh, is the, the, the consumer, the person using the card. So an acquiring bank, they get, they get a piece of that payment. There's an incentive there for them to be an acquiring bank. There's an incentive to be a um, issuing bank. I got this, the, in a, and this is in the back of my mind as I'm in this UPI session. They built, you know, uh, UPI is an Indian, uh, India payment solution that is digital. And, you know, you could imagine it, you know, today me and Kevin create a digital payment system in uh, the U.S. It is great. It will do everything you want it to do. Our adoption is going to be pretty slow because we're just another solution in a world of solutions. I got from this UPI that they built incentives in for the users, for the vendors to, and an adoption of it blew up, blew up. It didn't just like, la 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 la, it blew up. Your impressions of UPI? 14 billion transactions in one month. All right, that, that just now it wasn't at the beginning, but uh, in May of 2024, 14 billion transactions, billion with a B. That is B. But with okay, B. you know, there's a lot of things in UPI now. I, I got to tell you, granted, mm-hmm. the parent company of Pigeon is VSoft, which is in India and in the US. So I, uh, you know, and it was UPI that really helped in the building of the pigeon service that we, we learned from. So it wasn't my first exposure to it, but in seeing how well it was presented and getting more of the deeper details of, you know, there was some government intervention, full disclosure. Yes, we know that. But to see how well it's perceived by end users, that was phenomenal. To see the actual numbers, the use cases, that was phenomenal. I am, um, you know, mind you, this is this is at the end of an international trip with two days of hardcore learning. Um, this was at the point where I started scraping things that I could remember off the top of of, a, of the discussion. And the one part I, I scraped and, in, in, uh, you know, there was so much. Was there an incentive that if you signed up for UPI, you got free Internet for a year? I think there was one of those because there was other different types of incentives like that, that, you know, India is, again, huge. I mean, 135 million people, more than the U.S. I mean, I get, oh, sorry, 1.35 billion. Let me get the numbers right here. So <laughs> much bigger. There are also, you know, different sections, like are different states in the U.S. They do things differently. So there were different incentives that were offered from different regions, I want to say. Right. But if, you know, compare it to a card, no one's ever said, use this card and you'll get free internet for a year, you know? So just that adoption. You know, because I'm a big guy on what cards I use because of the kickbacks I get, you know, and the points and how they're used. So, I mean, there's some incentives that come along with them, but Mm -hmm. it it is different. It it's from from the card network. It's not from the payment network. That's the big differentiator. And then the, one of the, the, you know, the big differences here, which I think we're seeing in the U.S., was the whole idea that, um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, you can post a QR code and it, and uh, at the merchant, and in order to pay them, you, you scan the QR code, you say pay them this amount, boop, and, and then on the merchant side, they see that you paid that amount. Fascinating. Again, I have helped to build a system based off of that. We have that capability and it, it is a, that exact reaction for me <laughs> still when I'm able to see it be used. Mm-hmm. It does take the network and both sides having that capability though. Uh, so it is, it is fascinating though when you see it's used. The part that gets me with UPI that we don't see here in the US though is the fact that Joe, I can send you money but I can also text you within the UPI system about the money I sent you, or you can send me money back or information back, you know, like, Hey, Joe, here's the money I owe you for lunch. And you can send a thank you back. And it's through the secure same channel. That's fascinating. Um, I, I, you know, 
we'll have another session on it uh, someday, but uh, there's this book out called Smart Instant Payments by uh, some members of the um, Faster Payments Council. And I don't know if you, did you read it yet? Uh, read the I may data. have read that. I might have wrote a chapter. Oh, you were a writer of it. You know, I forgot about that. Reed's chapter, you know, he, he's like in the beginning uh, and it's all about communication. It's, you know, it didn't, he's not, doesn't start off about payments. Uh, we are going to have a session on, uh, I am going to have an episode on that. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I need to go grab the book. It's over there on my shelf, but there you go. You got it. Thank you for showing that. Yeah. I'm, I'm at, thank you. We have a, a uh, are you, did you hit number one yet? Because uh, we, we certainly bought a quantity for our members here. Kevin Wilson. Awesome. Oh yeah, we did. We bought a bunch. Uh, uh, but uh, so far, you know, I can, let me speak to the author and give you my real feedback. This is great. I, I just made it through the, uh, I know we're off topic here. I just made it through the ISO chapter and, you know, so many times you start an ISO conversation and poof, you're off the cliff. You're, the people are in the, the depths. It was, I, I would argue that if, if you were a student of payments with little to no um, uh, understanding of ISO, this chapter gives you a great foundation. Um, I haven't gotten to, what chapter are you in here? I didn't get to your chapter. What? Yeah, I use think you'll cases? find. I wrote the chapter on use cases. I haven't gotten to use cases yet. I was so enamored with the ISO chapter. Um, well, I, I did, did that too. And you know, I, I got to say, because I'm a uh, got to talk and work with people on that. I built a course on ISO where I do it as Neo from you know uh, the Matrix to help no explain. I don't know if you've ever seen those videos. They're most fun I've ever had with the course. I am really Neo. I'm asking you to pick which pill you want to take, but to be able to explain it because it's got to be done in a fun way. And I think the book did a great job of being able to break it down, to give you that foundation. Or like when you mentioned Cindy earlier to, mm -hmm. Hey, this is what you know. This is how you can relate it. ISO at first for me years ago was intimidating, but then I realized it's actually pretty simple. It mm -hmm. just does complex things, but it's not as complicated as we make it out to be. Now, having said that, if you are a programmer, there's a lot more to learn for it. Okay. okay. I was just going to say that as a, as a not a programmer. like us who needs to understand its uses. Like, for example, when we have, you know, when Nacha comes out with the faster payment certification, uh, which also will be from the Faster Payments Council, they're doing that together. I believe there will be questions on ISO and I'm not afraid of it. And I don't think anybody else should be after you read that chapter or go through my course um, because you'll find it's not as complicated. I, I think it's easier than ACH formatting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know. The light bulb goes off at least. Yes. Yeah, so from a, from a, you know, from a, uh, from an AAP perspective, I agree with you from a, I got to program this to work in a system, you know, that's, that's, that's deep. Um, what, um, oh, I was going to ask you, uh, your, uh, your, your version of it. I I'll ask you later. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have you and Steve on. So you can see what I'm talking about. All right. I'm going to, I think I'm going to have Steve Wasserman wrote that chapter on ISO. Um, and the use cases when I get to it, um, cause we have to promote, promote the book where uh we um again it's, you are it's a good book oh yeah 100 percent. i have i haven't uh there's so much history the the read stuff through me because i'm like why am i talking about a printing press which brings us back to the upi a messaging included in the upi uh system is 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 fascinating it's it's definitely um it's definitely something different and from a from a, an adoption perspective, it is it's huge. It's huge. Well, so another key to the adoption of UPI that people need to know about is it's also you could call it a mega app. And what I mean by that, and, and it's something I don't think we'll see here in the U.S., is I can go over and in India, I can get in an app that uses e UPI for payments, and I can send you money, or I can receive money from you. But I can also pay my rent. 
I can pay my bills. I can buy tickets to a movie. I can buy dinner reservations. I can pay for a tax. I mean, you name it, you can pay for it, use it all in that app. So Uber built into your app, you know, DoorDash built into your banking app. Imagine it that way. Bandango built into your banking app, all of it into one place instead of the separate apps like we experience here in the US is one of the key reasons why UPI is utilized and used so much. Fascinating. I, I was, again, uh, a, a session I thought, oh, India, UPI, what's, I, I think I heard something about that fantastic introduction. Uh, I've connected with the speaker uh, on it. Uh, I, I think, so I don't know if you know, we've reached another 30 minutes of I'm talking. <laughs> um, anything you want to say in closing? This will be part two of our Payments Alliance uh, International Review. Uh, anything you want to say in parting, something we missed, something uh, well, I think we nailed it all. I think we nailed enough that, you know, if you want to learn more, you need to sign up for Payments Innovation Alliance. You need to go ahead and, you know, use this podcast as your use case for why you should go to the international meeting and let your bosses watch it. Because, you know, if we're not giving you enough reason, I mean, I'm already anticipating next year. What are the things we're going to be able to learn? We already know in the U.S., when we put payments experts together, we're able to resolve issues. And Notcha does a great job of doing that. When we get to the level of going global, we are solving at a much higher scale. I know for me, I saw the solution to problems we haven't had yet but I know we're going to have. So can't encourage you guys enough. Go out there uh, while you're signing up for Nacha, that Smarter Instant Payments book that Nietzsche's got for you too. Faster Payments Council, that's Reed, uh, is also involved. It's another great area if you're working with payments to get involved with. Both of them I highly recommend. All right. So what did everybody think about that? I hope you learned a lot. I do, again, recommend that you go check out Payments Innovation Alliance. It's through NACHA. They have two meetings in the U.S. every year, and they have one meeting that takes place international. Now, those are in-person meetings. There are also a lot of different work groups that you can get involved with. It is one of those resources, organizations that I recommend to all electronic payments experts. I also highly recommend go check out Joe Casali. Start following him. Wrestling Payments. Joe's doing a wonderful Wonderful job. I'm a big fan of Joe's. I hope you will be too. For now, though, I got to say, class dismissed. <laughs>